in the US, in the European Union, they were talking about that this supply of weapons, supply of funds to Ukraine would improve Ukraine's negotiating position. How do you evaluate this policy? I watched uh, Secretary of State, and one of the things I was interviewed about on Al Qura, which is the truth in Arabic, a, a TV station that I helped set up when I was at the State Department. And I think the interviewer was a bit shocked, difficult to tell really because of the Arabic and having to translate back and forth. But I essentially told him what Colin Powell thought about Davos, a place where fat cats, oligarchs meet and discuss the world while the rest of the world is slaughtered in Gaza or in Ukraine or whatever. And then I watched the excerpt, it was just an excerpt, it wasn't the entire time, of course, but uh, uh, of Blinken meeting with Zelensky. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what is Anthony Blinken, this guy who's orchestrating uh, the diplomacy, as it were, with regard to Gaza and Israel, what is he saying to Zelensky? Because the man has lost. He has lost, and now his defeat is so significant that it may change the dynamics of what Vladimir Putin wants. It may change Putin's dynamic. If the war has not hurt him the way we're saying it has, and I don't think it has, his economy is booming. Things are looking good for Russia right now. He's got new allies. He's got new uh, maneuver room with regard to us, which I think he now we he now considers us his principal enemy. That's something we've done, a terrible thing, not a very smart strategic move, but we did it. Uh, it'll be 10 or 15 years before Russia uh, looks at the United States with any kind of uh, kindness again. Um, so we put him in that state Will he change now that the war is going so favorably for him? Will he decide that he wants all of Ukraine? I don't think so, because he really doesn't want another border that abuts NATO, however fragile NATO's future might be right now, and I think it's quite fragile. Um, but it's it, it just pained me to watch Blinken across the table from Zelensky talking about this, when Blinken, if he's got any sense at all, and I'm becoming very doubtful of that, he knows how badly Zelensky personally is losing right now. And Ukraine is losing almost as badly. But Zelensky is the representation of that significant defeat, all those casualties, all the problems. He's not tried to turn it, you know, and say, we stood up. We're, we're Finland. We're little Finland. And, and we've done something against the great big bear. Um, courage did it. The, the youth's courage, the people who went to the battlefield and so forth. No, he's not doing that. He's just, uh, he, he's slamming down the marker again and again and again. And he's beaten. He's, Ukraine is beaten. And every step we take beyond this is another nail in its coffin for more territory loss, more demands made on it, because ultimately we've got to go to some kind of negotiated ceasefire and then talks. He's running out of position. He's running out of negotiating room. Um, someone in Ukraine, and I'm not suggesting someone needs to assassinate him, but I'm saying someone in Ukraine needs to take the reins and be commonsensical and start a new approach to this. Otherwise, they're going to lose lots more of their country than they've already lost. Do you think that Anthony Blinken's policy and his team would be able to control Zelensky? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think it, you just look at him, look at his body language as he enters the room at Davos. Uh, and he's not dressed like anyone else either. I'm, I mean, I know what he's doing. He's sending this signal that I'm at war and this is my, my wartime garb. I got a feeling he'd be in that garb even if there weren't a war going on. That's the sort of person he is. He was a comedian speaking Russian on the stage in Russia and getting, you know, laughs and so forth. Um, now he's a president and, and he looks like a beleaguered president. And he looks like a president who thinks, really thinks down deeply that he's been betrayed 
And, 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 you know, from his perspective, maybe he has been. He believed hook, line, and sinker everything NATO told him, and particularly what Washington and London told him. And frankly, they were either out to lunch or they were stupid or they were lying to him, or at least they were hedging it because they wanted to bleed Ukraine, make the money off of it, make the statement, you know, do what they could to damage Russia, which now turns out not to have been very much at all other than dead people. And that's one reason we need to stop this thing now. We're killing too many people. Put that together with Gaza, put it together with the war in the Red Sea now, put it together with the East African problems. We've got some significant casualties occurring across the globe right now. We need to stop this stuff. We've got more important things to do. But Zelensky in that room looked as if he really would like to jump across the table and cut Anthony Blinken's head off. That's, that's the way it looked to me. But of course, he's not going to because he's got to keep kowtowing, as it were, in order to get what he can get out of NATO and ultimately out of the United States. But I don't think it's going to be very much more. We know that Germany's economy is shrinking, especially in 2024. They're talking about economies are talking about this. And right now they're talking about sending German soldiers to Poland. It's all the same history. It seems that it's so Isn't bizarre it? why they're doing this. And nobody can understand what's the reason behind all of these stupid measures. And look at what hap what's happening in Poland. Um, we were two of my former army colleagues and I were talking about that today. One of them said to me, and I echoed it right back to him, why in the world would we ever give Article 5 guarantees, extend NATO to countries who have been the battleground of empire for hundreds of years, if not thousands? Um, it's just a nonsense that we bought all these problems for this alliance that was time limited anyway. It's threat had gone away. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak on NATO uh, at the League of Women's Voters down in Williamsburg two weeks from now, and I've just finished reading their Great Decisions series article on NATO. And I started it, and the guy's just, oh, he's praising NATO all the way. Oh, NATO, NATO. And then he gets to the middle, and he suddenly does a vote fast, and he says, Okay, that's one side. Here's the other side. <laughs> and then he quotes Brent Scowcroft, one of the most brilliant strategists we've had in this country since World War II. And he says, this is what Brent said. Man, I'm not so sure it's good to expand NATO. It looks pretty stupid right now. <laughs> and then he goes on and he tells the other side of the story, so to speak. And at the end, he says, and the future of NATO is now well up in the air. No one knows where it's going. And I'll point at Germany and tell you that that is the key in Europe. I think it's the key ultimately, but Washington still has a big hand in there. But which way Germany goes is going to be which way NATO goes. And I think it's going to go fast and it's going to go down. And you just pointed out that one of the reasons is because we've done so much damage to Germany. When it comes to the bigger picture of that region of the conflict, especially what Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer are talking about, they are so focused on China. If we put ourselves in their shoes with the kind of thinking that they have, if they're so obsessed with China, why they're doing this to Russia? They would have Russia right in the middle to have some sort of balance instead of pushing Russia toward China. Well, you're talking about someone having some strategic sense. All you have to do is listen to people like Lindsey Graham or Schumer or McConnell or almost any member of Congress. The only one that's made any statement of any consequence in terms of sanity lately is Bernie Sanders, who just, I, I couldn't believe Bernie did what he did. I know, I know he's a decent man. I've met with him. I've talked to him at length. I know he's a decent man, but he condemned the Gaza situation. And he's a Jewish American, a senator, a Jewish American. Um, it, it's just, it's really hard to see any kind of strategic approach from the Congress, from the White House, from anybody in this country, other than we're the hegemon, we're the boss. If you don't do what we tell you to do, we will bash you. You know, I looked the other day, 
at the Congressional Research Service report on end strengths in our services. They are plummeting. I mean, we knew they were plummeting in terms of recruiting, but they're plummeting in general. I also looked at the Navy shipbuilding program for the next five years. We will not lay the keel on another CV, another aircraft carrier, to compose a strike group like the Eisenhower now, for example, until 28. And the money that that's going to require, I don't think is going to be there. But the bigger thing I found out was that of 11 aircraft carriers, which we possess today, only four are operational. Only four. And you're seeing them almost every day. I look, where are the other seven? And I look at where they are. Now, there's one that's operational in Port Yokosuka, Japan. But that, by the security agreement between Japan and the United States, must remain in Japanese home waters. So it's not available for this mess we're creating out in the Levant, particularly now the Red Sea and strikes on Yemen. We have no capacity to back any of this up, let alone to take on what you just suggested, the fact we've driven Russia into China's arms and China into Russia's arms. We have no force to take that on. So why are our leaders being so bellicose? I have to conclude that they're stupid. I, I, I can't see any other thing. How do you see the latest changes in Taiwan? It seems that the tensions are getting worse. I have to take exception there a little bit. I, I watched the elections pretty closely. I, I thought Willie Lai was going to William Lai was going to win. Uh, that's that's what we called him in the in the old days, William. <laughs> um, and I thought he was going to win because you have a real situation in Taiwan now in terms of the people themselves. They don't want anything to do with the Kuomintang. They don't want anything to do with William Lai. They don't want anything to do with the new party, the TPP. They really, by, by polling, want everything to stay the same. They don't want China moving in. They don't want anybody bothering them. They want their economy to be as booming as it is and even better. They want their technology lead to, to increase. They're very comfort comfortable. And so, you know, they went and voted, of course, but they would have preferred that they didn't have to do anything. That's what China's got to deal with. And I think Lai knows that that is the case. And so I think you're going to see him moving very swiftly, not to disavow his own party's credo or its aims or whatever, but not, he, he really spent a long time reaffirming that Taiwan's a democracy, and so he had to do that. But I think you're going to see him making some overtures to Beijing that are going to be overtures that say, let's let this go on for as long as we can, because it's very, very successful for both of us. We share high technology with you. You share things with us. We have so many people going back and forth, even though you're firing missiles over us and everything else. We don't need to disturb this. And I think Xi Jinping is going to agree. He's going to have to do some things like he's doing, you know, in order to show his displeasure with who was elected. But I think it's, I don't think it's going to wind up in war. Now, if it does tomorrow morning, I'll regret having said that, but I just don't think it is. I think they're too smart. They're, they're not like us. They're not stupid. Neither in Taipei or in Beijing are they stupid. In fact, I've been dealing with the Chinese now, actually since 1984, up close and personal since 2000, but I first went there in 1984. They're very smart people. Uh, I, I, I managed to get into the confines of the Central Party School. Um, I, I was there when Hu Jintao was head and before he became president. They're very smart people, incredibly smart people, and uh, much smarter than us, especially in terms of strategic thinking and in terms of all the people that, I mean, look, 1.4 billion people, we have 340 million. There are so many more smart people in China than there are in America. It's pitiful. And 
they're not the kind of people who are going to walk out on a limb and do something to disturb what they've got going right now, which is the best situation in 5,000 years. It is. And they've gotten rid of so many things that bothered them. This is the last thing you might say, the mandate of heaven must extend over Taiwan. But I don't think they're going to use force to do it. I really don't. They will only use force in my mind if we uh, compel them to. We'll have to do something really overt to get them to use force or really, really some rhetoric and diplomacy that's just dumber than hell. You know, this business of Nancy Pelosi when she visited Taiwan, those kinds, of, those kinds of things are just provocations. That's all they are. We need to stop that kind of thing. We need to look at Taiwan, look at the polls and say, all Taiwan wants to be is left alone and leave it alone. Both of us. China and Washington. Do you see any strategic plan on the part of the Biden administration, or we have to wait to see the next president of the U.S., whoever going to be, and see what would be the strategy of that administration? I do not. I, I see an inbox kind of performance. But I must say, too, that I've been watching some of the videos of President Biden and I'm coming around to agree with other people who are talking to me about the infirmity of the president. And I'm not sure I have confidence in President Biden's ability to think strategically any longer or on a continuous basis. I, I think we're seeing more and more the Sullivan, Blinken, and increasingly Kirby, the admiral, who's the spokesperson, who angers me every day when he opens his mouth because he says things like the South African case for genocide, an 84-page document that I've been through, that John Mearsheimer has been through, that others who know these issues have been through. I went through genocide and a declaration of genocide with Secretary of State Powell with regard to South Sudan. I know what it, con it, it, it constitutes under the convention. And the South African case is a beautifully articulated case, if one can use that adjective to talk about genocide. So Kirby saying, and, and, and then Blinken backing him up and saying it's unsupportable, <laughs> all these words that Kirby threw out there, you, you just want to slap them. They're, you can't be saying those kinds of things in the face of such a carefully crafted, meticulously detailed videos <laughs> case. You just can't do that. You have to be smarter than that. Um, I don't for a moment think that the international community is going to do what it should do with regard to this genocide. Um, that's another matter altogether. But the court in The Hague, if they do find for the, uh, for the South Africans, let's put it that way, they would be finding for the world as far as I'm concerned, it's going to create, it's going to, as, as Sir Nigel Rodley said to me in Sicily, we bother the bastards. That's the reason we do this stuff, because we bother the bastards. Well, in this case, the bastards are in Washington and Jerusalem. Larry, what's going on right now in the Red Sea? We have United States and UK. France was not willing to be part of this operation. Antony Blinken was trying so hard to convince these Arab countries to be part of this operation, they didn't accept. How do you see their policy right now in the Red Sea? I think everyone knows that the reason the Houthis have become a problem for shipping in the Red Sea is Gaza. <laughs> that if the Israelis were not doing what they're doing in Gaza, the Houthis would still be fighting the Saudis. They would not be doing what they're doing to shipping, international shipping in the Red Sea. When you know that, and you're not courageous enough to condemn Israel because you're looking over your shoulder at Washington and to a certain extent at London, then you got to find some other ways. And that's a way. That's an indirect way to say to the United States, screw you. We're not joining your coalition. The only reason that's happening is because of those peckers up there in Jerusalem who are killing people at the rate, uh, an unfathomable rate. So we're not coming. I think that's a very, very, it's an indirect statement, but it's a very strong statement. What we've seen so far that Anthony Blinken and his team, they're trying to 
put some sort of pressure on the Netanyahu administration. But it doesn't seem to be sufficiently influential on the Netanyahu administration. I was having a conversation with a general officer whom I have a great deal of respect for the other day, and I said, do you know what I think our strategy is in doing what we're doing in the Red Sea? It's to obfuscate the situation in the Middle East. It's to make the situation murky. It's to hide what Israel is doing and our inability to do anything about it or unwillingness to do anything about it. Therefore, we're going to widen the war. And that's what we've done. That's what we have done by attacking Yemen. I think, and there are people in this country, Lindsey Graham foremost amongst them, there are people who are recommending to President Biden that he use air power against Iran. Because that's, you know, I keep saying, that's the ultimate supporter. That's the ultimate backer of the Houthis, of Hezbollah, of Hamas, of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, of Lashkari. They've had, they have us supporting, they have Tehran supporting every terrorist group in the world right now. Doesn't matter that Nasrallah says, I don't take orders from Tehran. Yeah, I get some stuff from them, but I don't take orders from them. None of these terrorist groups take orders from Tehran, but we like to say they do. And I think we're we're obfuscating this whole situation right now in hopes that we can mask what Israel's still doing in Gaza. But to come to your point, your initial point, I don't think we brought any real pressure against Netanyahu. I think he's slowing down now, as we're seeing, and he's changing what he's doing slightly because he's losing a lot of people, either to wounded in action or killed in action, and because he has come to realize, maybe because Benny Gantz or somebody's beating on his head every day and telling him this, you are not going to exterminate Hamas. So quit saying you're going to exterminate Hamas. We'll get rid of as many Palestinians as we can. We'll we'll have pogroms in the West Bank. We'll have pogroms in East Jerusalem. We'll drive these people out. They'll go to Jordan. They'll, I don't care what Sissy says. I don't care where the king of Jordan says. They'll go there. We'll get enough of them out. And then if we have to, we'll bring some of them back into Gaza. But Ben Gavir and his boys will be out there developing settlements immediately. And so they won't have anything to come back to, at least not in northern Gaza. So we'll handle this situation, but we're not going to exterminate Hamas. And we're taking casualties. We got to stop this. I think that's what's making Netanyahu look like he may, may have determined that he has to quit pretty soon. Um, and I hope that's true. I don't care what causes him to quit as long as he quits. Um, I don't think it's us. I think it's the situation on the battlefield and the realization that they have a really dumb strategy. When they're talking about Hamas, everybody knows Hamas is a Sunni-based ideology. Iran is here. And, yeah. you know, there are mixing they don't, they don't ever everything. talk about that. <laughs> and it's, it's so amazing how ignorance is going on and on and not solving anything. And if you really want to get a handle on Hamas, if you really want to get a handle on him, you go for that emir in Qatar. That's who you go for, because he's the man supporting them with money, with arms, Whatever you want, that's the man who's supporting them. But we're not going to do that because Al Udeed is the largest air base in the world. We get our gas paid for there. We get our ramp space paid for there. We get our maintenance paid for. Everything's free there. And so the Pentagon would say, oh, no, you can't do anything that would you know, piss off Qatar. Um, it's a mess because we want it to be a mess, I think. I don't I don't think we're in, we're, we're intentionally... Well, I can't say that really. We are intentionally doing this, but I think we're keeping it a mess largely because of Israel. First, we were keeping it a mess because we thought there were people in this country. I had to deal with them. And when you talk about terrorism and fighting terrorists, you should have been there when we were telling them you don't fight a methodology. You don't kill a methodology. Terrorism is 5,000 plus years old. Um, killing people for political, killing civilians for political purposes is 5,000 years old. We call it terror today. Um, you can't say global war on terror. That is a ridiculous expression, just like war on drugs. How do you fight drugs with the military? How do you fight terrorists with the military? 
But we like to do that. We like to simplify things because we are a simple people, and that's not a compliment. I think what we're doing with regard to the Levant now, though, as I said before, I come back to my conversation with the general the other day, I think we're trying to obfuscate what's happening to hide, to camouflage what's happening in Gaza and get things more widely appreciated, if you will. And I think that might include some air attacks on Iran. I hope not, but I'm I'm listening to people talk about this in a way that reminds me back there of 2000, 2001, 2002, and three. Um, it's... It's absolutely absurd that we're doing this, in my view. But I, your your hint there about why we're still getting getting arms to Ukraine and so forth, it is money. You can't back away from that. It is a lot of money being made by a lot of people. Let's let's say that somebody gives some more arms to Ukraine and they give them to them in a way that's fast and furious, I'd be willing to bet you that the person who'll be picking up the tab for that down the road will be the United States. It's like uh, NATO in general. I was looking as I'm getting ready to give this talk down in Williamsburg, I was looking at the contributions that the 31 countries now, oh, when I look down that list, it scares me to death. Albania, Montenegro, we're, we've given Article 5 guarantees to these countries. When I look down that list and I look who's contributing, uh, not very much. Uh, one thing Donald Trump was right about when he was president, and my God, he might be again, um, was how little the other countries contribute. We'll be the bill payer. We, with a $34, $35 trillion aggregate debt, interest payments on that debt next year, close to a trillion dollars, we'll be the bill payer. Um, but where is that money going? It's going to the CEO of Lockheed Martin. It's going to the CEO of Raytheon. It's going to all these other companies that make these armaments of war and make profits off war. Um Go back to Afghanistan and Iraq and look at Halliburton, Dick Cheney's company, the vice president of the United States, in the two theaters of war in the time that we were there and Halliburton was functioning, they made $44 billion. Um, you, you, One person said to me, <laughs> Larry, when war's that profitable, you're going to have lots of it. And that's part of the reason. That's part of the problem. That That is the only explanation I can come up with logical explanation for putting Zelensky out on the tree limb he's out on right now, while we saw at the back and Russia saw us in between. That's the only reason I can see why we're doing this is money. And the fact that we had, I think, began to perceive, rightfully so, that our hegemony over Europe was slipping a bit. And this gave us an opportunity to come back in and sort of be dictator to all. You know, you will help Germany, you will help Poland, you will help, you know, everybody in, in NATO will help. Um, and that's falling apart now, too, as, as you well know. I'm looking at Poland the other day. They put what what they do, put the opposition leaders in jail or something like that. Um, this is this is a state that is going to be a paramount figure in NATO in the future. Uh sorry. Doesn't look like it to me. Democrats have rejected U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson's condition for allocating aid to Ukraine. Who's going to have the upper hand in this case of Ukraine at the end of the day? You almost have to parse it by individuals. There are individuals that come together in groups and agree, but you almost have to do that because you look at the Democrats and you say, warmonger. No, this person's still a progressive and not so much a warmonger. I'd call Joe Biden right now the number one warmonger in the world. That's what Joe Biden is right now, the number one warmonger in the world. Um, and he's he's losing, losing 100,000 progressives probably every week to 10 days. I don't see any way that if Trump is returned to the competition, so to speak, I don't see any way Joe Biden's going to beat him. I just can't see it. Depending on who you're looking at, whether it's Graham from South Carolina or McConnell or Schumer or whatever, 
you you've got different reasons and the reasons are coalescing at times to do things that might look sane like end the support for ukraine but you parse the individuals who are in that coalition to end the support for ukraine ukraine and you don't find anybody in there who's like you and i right now i'm talking about how stupid it is for Zelensky to keep on going and russia's winning etc um you get them talking about other things domestic politics or i just want to you know a lot of people like matt getz and others they just want to put some burr under some democrat's saddle um and they want to make their point uh, and they're going to make their point come hell or high water and then derail the whole financial system if they had to some of them would if they if they could so i don't think there's any coherence to the opposition i wish there were especially to ukraine but I don't think it's coherent opposition, and I don't think it's for the right reasons. It's for other reasons altogether, most of which are political, domestic political. Hey, but you. if if that if that stops the aid, I don't care. <laughs> as long as they're not thinking of inviting Russia to be part of these negotiations, these talks, how are they going to solve this? problems in Ukraine. No way. And that's just an insult to Putin. And that's what it's intended to be, is an insult to Putin. It is the poorest form of diplomacy, if it's even a form of diplomacy. Uh, I don't credit anybody in the Biden administration with even knowing what diplomacy is. Maybe William Burns, as I've said a number of times in the past, but as head of CIA, uh, what can he do? Uh, get hostages released, maybe. Um, there is not a diplomat in the Biden administration other than possibly Burns, and he's malpositioned. I, I don't understand how they even think Kirby, Sullivan, Blinken, Newland, that they're diplomats. They aren't even any, any diplomat. The di definition of diplomat in the Oxford English Dictionary obviates their being a diplomat, period. Um, and it's a snub. It's just... You, you you can't do that to your arch enemies even if you're trying to avoid a war with that enemy and you're trying to settle issues. You have to treat each other with some kind of decency. You have to. And we don't seem to be able to do that. We just don't. Part of the reason is because we don't like to lose. And I think these people know deep down they're losing. They don't have a clue what to do about it. So they're just going to wager a little more blood and treasure a little more. And by the way, the ranks down there that vote for us, they're making money off this. So, yeah, that's OK. That's how we're functioning today. That's how we're functioning. The conversation I had with the general officer involved several other people afterwards, and we all agreed. Much to my chagrin and sadness, we all agreed. We're all of us 70 to 80 years old. We all agreed this is the worst we have ever seen America in our lifetimes. The worst led, the worst strategy, the worst financial situation, the worst economic situation. And at a time when a lot of the indicators, as Jamie Dimon and others are telling us all the time, or looking pretty good for this or that or whatever. But the whole malaise, the whole mess that we're in right now has been created by a void of leadership. And you can't have a void of leadership without having a void of diplomacy too. So how do we fill that void? How have we filled, filled that void since my president, George W. Bush, took the oath of office with war? And I don't see any end to it. Larry, when you look at the history of the U.S., one of the most important presidents was Dwight Eisenhower. He was talking about this military-industrial complex. And do you see any other president who was willing to go against this military-industrial complex? I think they're all hoist upon their own petard now. I think the presidents, the Congress, and everyone else, with some limited exceptions, they've created this monster. And it's like the dictator who's riding the tiger. They cannot get off the monster because if they do, it'll eat them. 
So they have to keep riding the monster, even though they know that eventually the ride will kill them. They're caught. They're caught on the very apparatus that Dwight Eisenhower warned us about. He foresaw this. His talk in 52 was even more powerful than his address when he left and talked about the military industrial complex, when he said, it's in every state house. It's in every federal building. It's everywhere. This sickness, this corruption, this filth, this warmongering, it's in every sinew of this country. And if you let it go any further, if you let it get out of hand, you will regret it and the country will regret it and you'll come to an end. That's what Eisenhower was hinting at when he talked to, I think it was the Association of American Newspapers. Um, powerful speech. Powerful speech where he compares the price of one bomber to so many homes and a price of one fighter or destroyer or whatever, all the people that aren't fed because you put that ship to sea, all the people that don't have warm clothes or a home, a roof over their head because you put those aircraft in the air. Now, Eisenhower was a five-star general. He knew that you needed a certain amount of security. You needed a certain amount of equipment. But he knew that if you let that get out of hand, if you let it begin to be your boss, you were done. And that's what he feared. And I think today he's rolling in his grave. How the military industrial complex is out of the hand of the U.S. president, in your opinion? Absolutely. Uh, the U.S. president, as I said, is up on that petard. It's lit. It's going to explode. Only way he avoids it is jumping off and getting on a bigger one and then jumping off and getting on a bigger one. Um, the complex has him just as it has Senator Inhofe. It has Senator Graham. It has everybody involved with it. It has them all captured because it's all money. Money, money. That's the reason I, the, the, the setting that Blinken chose to make these remarks to meet with Zelensky and so forth in Davos brought vividly back to my mind Powell's description of the people at Davos, the fat cats, the oligarchs, the people who, you know, Jane and Joe in Sao Paulo, in London, in Berlin, whatever, don't even know exist wouldn't know them if they saw them on the television screen. What is Davos? Where is Davos? Oh, it's in Switzerland. Oh, uh, World Economic Forum. What is that? They don't even know. But these people go there and pontificate. That's the last place I would take foreign policy and diplomacy. The last place I would go and make the kinds of statements that Blinken made. The last place I would go and show up as if I was enjoying myself. And yet that's what they did. That's what we have now. That's the kind of leadership we have. Those are the kind of people we have in charge of this country now. America is a bad deal. At least you've got Lula. <laughs> Pretty smart guy. Did I ever tell you that he's the guy who helped us with Cuba? Iowa senator said that just two days ago, he said that the level of ammunition that Russia is producing in one day is equal to what the U.S. is producing in one month. If the military-industrial complex is receiving such a big budget from the government, why they're not capable of producing at the same level that Russia is producing right now? We've let it come down to a monopoly. That's what we've done. We've let five defense contractors, maybe six on any given day, collude in such a way that one of them's prime and the others are subs. And then the next time around, one, the next one's the prime and the others are subs. And so they've narrowed everything down, as you just described, artillery for, uh, rounds, for example. They've narrowed everything down to where it's efficient and a massively profitable. But it's not productive of the kind of production you'd need like for a World War II or a World War I. And now... When they've got the possibility of upping their production, they go to their board meeting and they look at it and they say, wait a minute, if we reopen Rock Island, if we reopen Picatinny or whatever that place is out there, uh, I visited it one time, 
if we reopen these facilities or we expand or we allow these other people to co-produce what is our technical tech data package, it's going to cost money. It's going to be an investment and maybe we'll make, but we can't, we can't guarantee that this is going to go on. I mean, we're not, we're not as stupid as Joe Biden. We see Russia is winning. Hmm. Maybe we should start cutting back. And if you tell me I got to build that, or activate that plant out there, that's going to cost me so much money. It's going to take six months or whatever, maybe a year. And then the war's over and we've lost. Uh, I don't think I want to commit to that. I want to keep myself lean and mean and just in time and making maximum profit so I can haul myself out the door with another million dollars every 15 minutes. That's, I think, the reason. I'm not an economist, but I think that's the big reason. That's what I'm hearing from the, the top five, the top six who do this sort of thing. 